Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. You can also send a one-time donation with the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Or you can donate by mail to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. That's P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. Or become one of our ongoing uh, Patreon supporters with a donation as low as $2 a month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for today's episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. The original air date, August the 10th, 1951. And this one is the Abandoned Well Murder Case. Presenting Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. A new weekly feature on NBC's all-star festival of mystery, comedy, music, and drama. Brought to you by Chesterfield. Always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking. Plus, no unpleasant aftertaste. By Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television. Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight, the famous old investigator's case is entitled The Abandoned Well Murder Case. Our scene is a deserted farm about 60 miles from New York. It's almost dusk, and a middle-aged, well-dressed man with iron-gray hair paces back and forth near an abandoned well. Mounting annoyance, he glances towards the overgrown shrubbery that surrounds the well. Con, found it. It must be almost 7.30. I don't like to be kept waiting. What the devil can... Who's that? Is that you? Well, it's about time you... You! What are you doing with that gun? Are you crazy? No! No, don't shoot! You've killed me. Well, here, Mr. Keene, are them papers on the Brennan case. All ready to file and marked closed. Yes, Mike, that was a difficult case. Now, perhaps it's time you and I took a few days' vacation. No fishing trip, or... Well... Can I help you, ma'am? Uh... Are you Mr. Keene? No, I'm his partner, my chance. Oh, please, I, I must see Mr. Keene at once. I didn't phone for an appointment. Well, now, who are you, ma'am? I'm Mrs. Crane, Mrs. Rachel Crane. Well, this is Mr. Keene right here. And how do you do, Mrs. Crane? Oh, Mr. Keene, I, I'm so upset, so frightened. Well, please sit down and tell me what's the trouble. Thank you. Mr. Keene, my, my employer, Henry Kellogg, has been murdered. Your employer? Yes, sir. I'm his housekeeper at Hillview. That's Mr. Kellogg's estate about 60 miles from here. Ten years ago, he took me and my little daughter into his home and gave me a position as his housekeeper. No one could have been more kind, more, more sympathetic. Try to compose yourself, Mrs. Crane, and go on with your story. Well, Mr. Keene, the night before last, Mr. Kellogg left the house for his evening walk. When he didn't return by midnight, I became worried and called the local police. Yesterday afternoon, they 
They found Mr. Kellogg's body at the bottom of an abandoned well on the farm next to ours. He'd been shot through the heart. Saints preserve us. You mean he'd been murdered and his body dumped into the well? Yes, Mr. Clancy. Oh, it was a horrible thing. Mrs. Crane, I assume the local police are investigating the murder. So why have you come to me? Because, Mr. Keene, unless you can help me, they'll probably arrest me for Henry Kellogg's murder. Why do you say that? Because... Well, because I happen to know that he was leaving me $20,000 in his will. After all, I've been working for him for ten years. But last week, he told someone in town that he was discharging me. Discharging you? Mm-hmm. After ten years of service as his housekeeper? What was the reason? Well, I... I can't imagine, Mr. Keene. Had you ever had a disagreement or a serious quarrel of any kind with Mr. Carroll? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. Did he tell you he was going to discharge you? No, but he was a man of impulse, of sudden whims. Mr. Keene, you can see this puts me in a frightening position. The police will think I knew I was being discharged and that I murdered poor Mr. Kellogg before he had a chance to change his will. Well, a $20,000 inheritance could be a motive for committing murder. And another thing. The police found that the bullet that killed Mr. Kellogg was from a gun he kept on the estate. A gun which any member of his household might have gotten hold of. I see. Mrs. Crane, who else lives there on the estate? Just myself and my daughter, Doris. She's a young woman now. She's 21 years old. Mr. Kellogg has no close relatives? Well, he has a nephew, Paul Kellogg, who lives here in New York. The police tried to reach him, but there was no answer at his apartment. I imagine he's at his cabin on Crystal Lake. Mrs. Crane, do you know if the nephew, Paul Kellogg, will inherit the bulk of Henry Kellogg's fortune? Why, no. Mr. Kellogg told me once that he intended to leave everything to charity. Everything, that is, except his bequest of $20,000 to you. Well, yes, Mr. Keene. And that's why I came to you. I beg you to find the real murderer so I can clear myself. Tell me, is there anyone else who might have had reason to murder your employer? Anyone who hated him, possibly? Why... Yes, Mrs. Green? There's Jasper Gibb. He's an eccentric old man who used to own the farm next to Mr. Kellogg's estate. Two weeks ago, Mr. Kellogg foreclosed a mortgage on Jasper Gibb's place. Jasper made all kinds of wild threats to get revenge. Indeed. Oh, but no one takes Jasper seriously. He's a harmless old crackpot. Well, we'll know more about that after Mike Clancy and I have talked to him. Oh, Keen, then you will help me. Well, to you, I had nothing to do with Mr. Kellogg's murder. Why, I always admired him. And I was grateful for his kindness to me and my daughter, Doris. Mike and I will be ready to drive you to the murdered man's home within the hour, Mrs. Crane. I have a feeling that if we're to find Henry Kellogg's murderer, there isn't a moment to lose. <laughs> Here we are, Mr. Keene, Mr. Clancy. This is Mr. Kellogg's home. Well, sure, it's a mighty elegant place, boss. A real country estate. Yes, Mike. One would think it would require a staff of servants to run it. Mr. Kellogg didn't like a lot of people around. He... What is it, Mrs. Crane? Well, that car in the driveway. It's Mr. Paul's roadster. You mean Henry Kellogg's nephew? Yes, sir. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Crane. Why, Mr. Paul, I didn't know you were here. I was up at my lake cabin. I got back to New York this morning, and the police phoned and told me Uncle Henry had been murdered. Who are these gentlemen, Mrs. Crane? It's Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, the private investigators. Mr. Keene, this is Mr. Kellogg's nephew, Paul. Oh, Mr. Keene, I've often heard of you. How do you do, Mr. Kellogg? Glad to meet you, young fellow. Uh, please come into the house, gentlemen. This whole thing is shocking. But, Mrs. Crane, I had no idea that you'd gone into the city to bring Mr. Keene into the case. Doris didn't tell me. My daughter didn't know. Now, Mr. Keene, if you'll all excuse me, I want to put away my things and see where Doris is. Certainly, Mrs. Crane. Mr. Kellogg, you say you just arrived here at your uncle's home? About five minutes ago, Mr. Keene. So, Mrs. Crane, the housekeeper, has asked your help in solving Uncle Henry's murder. I suppose she's very worried the situation being what it is. Just what do you mean by that, Mr. Kellogg? Well, look at the spot she's in. 
After that quarrel with Uncle Henry, it's no wonder she's panicky. Quarrel? Sure Mrs. Crane never mentioned any quarrel to us, boss. No, Mike. She told us she and Henry Keller were on the best of terms. She didn't tell you of her threats against him? Threats? What threats, Mr. Kellogg? Suppose you tell us about that. Certainly, Mr. Keene. You haven't met Mrs. Crane's daughter, Doris. When you do, you won't find it difficult to understand how she captured poor old Uncle Henry's fancy. He wanted to marry Doris Crane. Marry her? Well, sure, I thought your uncle, the murdered man, was, was in his 50s. He was, Mr. Clancy. And Doris Crane is 21. About two weeks ago, her mother found out what was going on. Mrs. Crane nearly blew the roof off. You mean she disapproved? Disapproved? That's putting it mildly, Mr. Keene. She told Uncle Henry to stay away from her daughter, that she'd see him dead before she'd let Doris marry him, a man almost old enough to be Doris's grandfather. Well, sure, and I can't say that I blame the woman, a young, innocent girl like Doris Crane. Innocent? Uh, Mr. Clancy, one would hardly use that description of Doris Crane. She's as cold and calculating a female as you've ever met. Now, Mr. Kellogg, were you here when the housekeeper, Mrs. Crane, threatened your uncle's life? Yes, I was, Mr. Keene. And how did Henry Kellogg react to it? Uncle Henry was very calm, but he said he intended to go right on doing what he felt was best. Then Mrs. Crane turned and left the room. I'll never forget the look of hatred in her eyes. Well, surely he never said a word to us, Mr. Keene, about her daughter being mixed up with the murdered man. However, Paul Kellogg has taken good care to mention it, haven't you, Paul? Uh, uh, Doris, I... I didn't hear you come in. No, no. You were much too busy trying to cast suspicion on my mother. Uh, Mr. Keene, this is Doris Crane, the housekeeper's daughter. How do you do, Doris? This is my partner, Mike Clancy. Pleased to meet you. Mr. Keene, mother tells me she's asked your help in clearing her suspicion in the murder. Well, she's going to need it with someone like Paul Kellogg spreading lies about her. Lies? One what? moment, please. Tell me, Doris, just what was your relationship with the murdered man, Paul Kellogg? I planned to marry him, Mr. Keene. He was head over heels in love with me. Of all the rotten luck for this to happen. You don't mind my saying so, Doris. You don't seem grief-stricken about the murder of the man you loved. I didn't say I loved Henry Kellogg. I wanted to be mistress of his estate. I wanted expensive clothes, jewels, and lots of money to spend. He could have given me those things. Well, I never heard anything so cold-blooded. Cold-blooded? I'm simply being truthful, Mr. Clancy. Which is more than you can say for Henry Kellogg's nephew, Paul. Just what is that supposed to mean? Why not tell Mr. Keene about your own relationship with your uncle? And just what was that relationship, Doris? Mr. Keene, uh, Doris is making a mountain out of nothing. I'm perfectly willing to tell you that Uncle Henry and I never got along too well. In fact, two weeks ago, he ordered you off the estate. Is that true, Mr. Kellogg? Yes, Mr. Keene, it's true. I, I told Uncle Henry right to his face that I thought he was a fool for wanting to marry Doris. A girl young enough to be his granddaughter. He ordered me to get out of the house. And I know that what Doris here is insinuating, that I murdered Uncle Henry to get his money. I'm not so sure that you didn't, Paul Kellogg. That's a lie. You know very well I didn't. Now, Mr. Kellogg, do you inherit any of your murdered uncle's estate? No, Mr. Keene. I haven't a chance of getting a penny of it. I, I, I'm not even mentioned in his will. So I had no reason whatever to murder him. <laughs> what? Thanks, Miss Albert. What was that? Mr. Keene. It's mother. It came from the study. Come on, Mike. Mr. King, Mr. King, come here to the study quickly. What is it, Mrs. Crane? Look there at the window, boss. There's a man trying to climb out. After him, Mike. Right, sir. Hold on, your dog face. Fuck all your... Staying right here. Get away from me. Keep the way I'm warning you. Oh, so it's a fight you're after, is it? Well, now, I Hey, now. Hold it, you Sneaking into other people's houses, are you? Mrs. Crane, do you know this man? Yes, Mr. King. It's Jasper Kidd, the man I told you about. The one whose farm was foreclosed by Mr. Kellogg. Well, now, what do you think of that? Oh, he gave me such a scare. I was coming along the hall when I saw him at the desk in the study. The minute I screamed, he started for the window. Uh, Mike, you'd better search Jasper Gibbs. He may be armed. No. Take your hands off, oh, Mike. Hold still now. Well, now, take a look at this, boss. A long, ugly knife in the pocket of his overalls. Give me that. Not until you tell us what you meant to do with it, Jasper Gibbs. And explain why you broke into this house. I advise you to tell the truth. Because right now, you appear to be the most logical suspect in Henry Kellogg's murder. Mr. Keene will return in just a moment. But first... If you'd like to know a quick, 
easy way to ease the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, then by all means, try Anison. Your own dentist or physician may, at one time or another, have handed you an envelope containing Anison tablets. Then you already know how incredibly fast and effectively Anison brings relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. For your own sake, try Anison. Anison is sold to you on this guarantee. If the first few tablets do not give you all the relief you want, as fast as you want it, you may return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison tablets at any drug counter. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. <laughs> Now back to Mr. Keene and the abandoned well murder case. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy, are investigating the mysterious murder of wealthy Henry Kellogg, who was shot to death. His body was found at the bottom of a well on an abandoned farm next to his estate. A moment ago, Jasper Gibbs, an embittered old farmer, was found hiding in the study of the Kellogg home. Now, as Henry Kellogg's nephew, Paul... His housekeeper, Rachel Crane, and Rachel's daughter, Doris, look on. Mr. Keene is saying to Jasper Gibbs, You'd better explain what you're doing here, Jasper Gibbs. I've got nothing to say. You've got no right to question me. He's got every right, mister. This is Mr. Keene. Mr. Keene, the investigator? All right, I'll tell you why I come here. When I heard about Henry Kellogg being murdered, his body found in the old well on my farm. Your farm? You mean the farm adjoining this estate belongs to you? It was mine. Till Henry Kellogg foreclosed the mortgage and took it away from me. And you swore that you'd get even with him, didn't you, Gibbs? Well, I... I was pretty sore, Mr. Keene. I I went to Henry Kellogg and I told him what I thought of him. Did you also tell him you would kill him? Well, I... Maybe I did. Don't remember. You know very well you did, Jasper Gibbs. You keep out of this, Rachel Crane. Mr. Keene, I... I come here to find out what they were saying about me. Mrs. Crane, the housekeeper, and her daughter, Doris. I came in and I hid... In Henry Kellogg's study, or see what I could over here. Why, that's ridiculous. Perhaps you meant to commit another murder. Watch out what you're accusing, Mrs. Crane. Maybe you won't talk so fast when I tell Mr. Keene what I know about Henry Kellogg and your daughter. What do you know about me? How dare you... One moment, Doris. What is it you know, Gibbs? Just this, Mr. Keene. This girl, Doris Crane, she used to meet Henry Kellogg secretly down by the abandoned well. The place where he was murdered. I saw them there together a lot of times. Well? And what have you did? And I wouldn't be surprised if you met him there the other night, Doris Crane. And put that bullet through his heart. Mr. Keene, this man's insane. Why should I murder Henry Kellogg? I intended to marry him. It's quite possible, Doris. That Henry Kellogg may have changed his mind about marrying you. You admitted to me that you didn't love him. Perhaps he found that out. Oh, Mr. Keene. Well, you don't know what you're saying. My daughter Doris wouldn't commit a murder. As for you, Mrs. Crane, the fact that you neglected to tell me you strongly opposed your daughter's relationship with Henry Kellogg, that you even threatened him... Who told you about that? Paul Kellogg, the murdered man's nephew. Yes, I did, Mrs. Crane. I felt Mr. Keene should know all the facts. Including the fact that you and your uncle hated each other? Mr. Keene knows about my quarrels with Uncle Henry. He also knows that I would have had nothing to gain by killing him. Mr. Keene... Maybe I know something that'll help you. What is it, Jasper Gibbs? If you come down to the old mill with me, the old well, the place where Henry Kellogg was murdered, something I got to show you. Boss, I'll bet it's a trick. It ain't no trick. Very well, Gibbs. Now, the rest of you wait here, please. Come along, Mike. Let's find out what it is that Jasper Gibbs is so anxious to show us at the scene of the murder. <laughs> Oh, well, right up ahead, Miss King. So I see. Now then, Gibbs, what did you want to show us? Miss King, as soon as I heard about Henry Kellogg being murdered here at the old well, I came snooping around, and I found something that the police didn't notice. Look, look, right there, where I'm pointing. What is it, Mr. King? There seems to be some tiny pieces of glass at the edge of the well, Mike. That's right. And back at the house, I seen the housekeeper's daughter, Doris Crane, 
She was wearing a necklace made of glass beads. Yes, Professor, but he's right, boss. I saw the necklace myself. And so did I, Mike. But Jasper Gibbs, it seems to me you're very eager to plant suspicion on Doris Crane. I'm only trying to help you find Henry Kellogg's murderer. Well, I'll put these slivers of glass in my pocket. Mike and I will be getting back to the house. Where are you staying, Gibbs? Well, I got a room in town. I warn you, don't try to leave. Or you may find yourself in an even more dangerous position than you already are. Come along, Mike. Let's get back to Henry Kellogg's house. And here's the front door, Mr. Keene. I got the lights lit inside. It's getting dark. Now I'll ring the doorbell, Mike. And, Mike, remember, not a word about those slivers of glass we found at the old well. Sure, I won't say a thing. Oh, Oh, Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy, come in. Yes, Mrs. Crane. Well, what did that crazy old man, Jasper Gibbs, have to show you down at the well? Nothing of importance, Mrs. Crane. Of course not. He's an eccentric old crackpot. But completely harmless. I'm not so sure, Paul Kellogg. In fact, I've been wondering just why he sneaked in here a while ago. And what he was doing at the desk in your uncle's study. My uncle kept all his private papers in that desk. Mr. Keene, do you think... Maybe Jasper Gibbs was trying to steal the mortgage papers, hoping to get his farm back. I'm afraid that wouldn't do him much good. Well, maybe we ought to keep the door to that study locked, at least until Uncle Henry's murderer is caught. I think that's a good idea, Mr. Kellogg. None of your uncle's private papers should be touched until I've had a chance to go over them thoroughly. In fact, I want to search the entire study for a possible clue. Do you want to do that now, Mr. Keene? No, it's getting late. But Mike and I will do it first thing in the morning. Uh, Mrs. Crane... Is there a room for us to spend the night in here in the house? Oh, yes, Mr. Keene. You and Mr. Clancy can have the guest room on the second floor. Good. Uh, and Mrs. Crane, uh, do you have the key to Henry Kellogg's study? Why, yes. Here on the mantel. Mr. Kellogg always kept it in this little box. Oh, would you give the key to Mike Clancy, please? Would I? Why do you hesitate, Mrs. Crane? I... Very well. Here's the key, Mr. Clancy. Well, thanks. Mike... I want you to lock the door to Henry Kellogg's study and keep the key in your pocket. Right. Tomorrow morning, we'll go over every inch of the study. Because I have a feeling we may discover something in that room which may lead us straight to Henry Kellogg's murderer. in the morning. We've been hiding here in Henry Kellogg's study for two hours. I don't think we'll have much longer to wait, Mike. I'm sure none of them heard us come in here. Well, boss, do you think... Wait, Mike. Come under the window. Quick, let's get in that closet. Right, sir. Leave the closet door open just a crack, Mike, so we can see and hear what goes on. Okay. Climbing in the window. Just as I expected. Saints preserve his boss. Quiet, right, Mike. Open the closet door, Mike. <gasps> Good evening, Paul Kellogg. King and Clancy, what are you doing here? We don't have to ask what you're doing here. You came to get that envelope from the secret drawer in your uncle's desk. Hand it over, please. No, the boss says to hand it over. Yes. Here's the envelope, Mr. Kingsley. Thank you, Mike. I'll just take a look inside. Well, look at this, Mike. It's a fortune in negotiable bonds. I should say at least $200,000 worth. Give me those bonds. I don't think so, Paul Kellogg. I'll need them as evidence. That you murdered your Uncle Henry Kellogg. You're out of your mind, Keene. You can't prove a thing. I have evidence that puts you on the scene of the crime. You claim that you first heard of your uncle's murder this morning. But I found slivers of glass near the spot where he was shot to death. What does that prove? Later, I noticed that the crystal on your wristwatch is broken. You must have smashed it when you pushed your uncle's body into the well. It'll be an easy matter to prove that the slivers of glass came from your watch. Well, you're licked, mister. So you may as well admit it. All right, I'll admit it. I murdered my uncle to get those bonds. 
A month ago, I found out by accident that he kept them in that secret drawer in his desk. Nobody knew about them. They weren't even mentioned in his will. But I knew I'd have to work fast before he married that girl, Doris Crane, and she found out about them. So you murdered your uncle, hoping to pin the crime on Doris or her mother. You planned to come back here later to get hold of the hidden bond. But a few hours ago, when you suggested a study door be kept locked, I suspected the truth. That something was hidden in here that you were anxious to get your hands on. So you laid a trap for me. All right, Keen, but you haven't trapped me yet. Get your hands up, both of you. Watch it, boss. Oh. You shot me in the hand. You're lucky I didn't put a bullet in your head, Kellogg. I was waiting for you to pull a gun. So I shot right through my coat pocket. Good work, Mike. You can take Paul Kellogg into custody. When he faces a judge and jury, he'll learn the price he'll have to pay for murder. And so Mr. Keene finds this solution to the abandoned well murder case. a word from RCA Victor. When you buy RCA Victor television with RCA factory service, you get television's greatest combination. Any RCA Victor television owner can get RCA factory service with or without a contract. If your RCA Victor television set needs attention, simply call the RCA service company branch nearest you. Attention engineers. RCA is the world leader in radio, first in television, and first in recorded music. To maintain this position, and to achieve even greater developments in this unlimited field of electronics, RCA can use more engineers. RCA is producing electronic products for the armed forces, as well as a wide variety of commercial products, and needs qualified engineers for these long-range projects now. If you are an electronics engineer... RCA can offer you substantial opportunities. Send a complete resume of your education and experience to Radio Corporation of America, Box 1, RCA Building, Radio City, New York. Remember, RCA Building, Box 1, Radio City, New York. again next week to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, a new weekly feature on NBC's All-Star Festival of mystery, comedy, music, and drama, brought to you by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste, by Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music and first in television. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Gene Carroll. Directed by Richard Leonard. Philip Clark plays Mr. Keene. Your announcer, Jack Costello. Remember, Mr. Keene is now on the air at this new time every Friday at 9.30 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Friday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the poison sandwich murder case. Next, it's music with Roy Shields on NBC. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Well, an enjoyable uh, episode of Mr. Keene with, I'd say, above average logic and an above average killer for this series. Uh, I did uh, love the end where uh, Mike Clancy still ended up shooting the guy uh, when he pulled a gun. I mean, when you're Mike Clancy at this point, you just know that most weeks you're going to end up shooting somebody, so you better have the gun at the ready. All right, listener comments and feedback now, and uh, 
If you follow me on Facebook or uh, YouTube, uh, you would have seen that I posted a video uh, letting folks know after we crossed 100 uh, voters in our listeners' uh, choice survey at vote.greatdetectives.net, as well as advising people that there were two polls to vote in. And we got uh, quite a bit of feedback on Facebook. I'm not going to read through it all just because there is quite a bit. But I'll read a sampling of what we got. And I don't want to thank everybody who commented over there. Debbie writes, nice to see you. Ugh, too many to choose from. I thought it would be so easy. But looking at the list, it reminds me of some I forgot that I really enjoyed. Great job. Thanks. Well, thanks, Debbie, and I'd agree, this is definitely a challenging list, and narrowing down the shows you enjoy, always a difficulty, but it's a fun exercise. Brian mentioned that he changed his list a few times in the course of casting his vote. Kirk comments, here's an idea for a dark comedy you're free to have, the old-time radio detective rest home for treatment of post-concussion syndrome and CTE. These guys have to uh, suffer from it. Uh, They get knocked out every episode. All the greats reside there. An interesting idea, Kirk. I'm probably not the uh, writer to use it, though, but thanks so much for the suggestion. And then a uh, comment from Michael, love all the shows. Will we be seeing a return of Richard Diamond, Philip Marlowe, or Not Beat? I really enjoy yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Dragnet, Rocky Jordan, and Boston Blackie, though I've been on the fence about Stand By for Crime and Mr. Keen. Also, uh, will we hear a run of Blackstone the Magic Detective? Keep up the great work and look forward to a great 2019 of Great Detectives. Well, thanks so much for uh, the question, Michael. Or I should say questions. I guess I'll start with the first one. If we have episodes that we didn't have available when we played the series the first time, we'll definitely bring you those. Plus, we have the listener's choice uh, voting going on. And if if Richard Diamond, Not Beat, or Philip Marlowe finish in the top 20, we'll be glad to focus on them. However, in terms of a long-term revisit, I don't see that in the near future. For one thing, it's been less than a year since we finished up Not Beat and Richard Diamond. And just two years before that, we completed Philip Marlowe. Given that we don't have as many shows available, it's inevitable that we're going to have to do some uh, revisits. However, I'm minded to revisit programs from earlier in the show's history than that. As to Blackstone Magic Detective, that's not one I'd really like to do. Uh, I listened to it, and it seemed to really rely on visual magic tricks, which don't actually translate all that well to radio. Thanks so much for all the questions, and now we have a listener recommendation on Facebook. Jenny writes, I enjoy Great Detectives by Adam Graham for many reasons. I'm a mystery fan who enjoys the plots and figuring out who done it. Adam's well-researched comments bring an extra depth to the show. They're actors and writers. I found shows where I love the writing, uh, Box 13, Broadway is my beat, not beat. I've come to love many of the characters, e.g. Johnny uh, Dollar, Philip Marlowe, Rocky Jordan, and their voices, uh, Gerald Moore. It gives me a glimpse into what life was like for my parents and grandparents and what it was like to live through World War II. I see how far American society has progressed in its attitudes towards women and racial and religious minorities, and where some things have yet to change. It's a great uh, escape from the stresses of today. It's a load of fun. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jenny. Uh, Very well stated. I appreciate so much your recommendation. 
All right. Well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Stand By for Crime. And then we'll be back again uh, next Monday with another episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. Remember, uh, I encourage you to, if you've not already, cast your vote in the preliminary round of the listener's choice voting at vote.greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.